Life seemed to be going pretty well for Bob Hansen. It was 1990. The Hansons were living in Northern Virginia. Bob had been promoted to the FBI inspection staff, which took him to field offices around the world. His relationship with Priscilla was about to take off. I said, I got a car? You got me a car? And his side business was humming. Tens of thousands of dollars rolled in courtesy of his Soviet paymasters. They even exchanged a couple of diamonds they'd given him over the years for liquid cash. The USSR may have been on the verge of collapse, but the money was as green as ever. Still, that year, it could have, and arguably should have, all come crashing down on Hansen. I joined the FBI in 1978. This is Mark Walk. He joined the FBI two years after Hansen and, like him, worked foreign counterintelligence cases. Special Agent Walk had another title relevant to this story, brother-in-law. I know him as Bob. He married my sister in 1968 when I was a senior in high school. Walk and Hansen weren't particularly close, personally or professionally. Their assignments never overlapped. He wasn't an easy person to know. Uh, not really, because he was not a, a communicator. But they'd occasionally cross paths at family weddings or talk about their shared interest in computers. That was about it. You could never, ever get Bob to talk to you for more than about five minutes uh, unless you got him onto something uh, kind of arcane about computers, and then he'd talk your arm and leg off. Walk spent most of his career in Chicago, where he and Bonnie had grown up. He remained close with his sister into adulthood, even though the Hansons were on the East Coast. In August of 1990, Walk, his wife, and their four kids packed up their family car and headed for Northern Virginia. While Walk attended a conference for FBI and State Department officials, his family spent time with the Hansons and Bonnie's other sister, who lived in the same neighborhood. Two things happened that stood out to Walk. One, at the conference, he heard a rumor that sounded plausible. I was told by somebody that I trusted that there was a, a big mole hunt going on in the FBI. And two, he learned that Bonnie had found a stash of money. Mark's wife heard the story from his sister, Jean. She said Bonnie came running up the street. She was very, very worked up. And she told Jean that she had just discovered $5,000 in his sock drawer in cash. It seemed like a lot of money to have floating around in your sock drawer. Walk and his family drove back to Chicago. He sat with his thoughts. His suspicions deepened. Walk also remembered another phone conversation he'd had with Bonnie five years earlier as he was heading to language training. My sister called me and said, Bob says, uh, oh, isn't that cool that you're learning Polish? We might uh, retire in Poland. And I was absolutely flabbergasted. And I said, Bonnie, that's crazy. This was in the teeth of the Cold War. Poland was firmly behind the Iron Curtain. So the idea of retiring to a Soviet bloc country, as Poland was at that time, uh, was outrageous. Especially for an FBI counterintelligence agent. At the time, it was weird, but now it stuck out as suspicious. He had no hard evidence his brother-in-law, Bob Hansen, was a spy. But these were circumstantial blips that could have amounted to something. Or been nothing. See something? Say something? Or let it go? I sat down with my wife and talked the whole thing over. I was very much aware that... Uh, even though I thought that uh, objectively there were grounds for looking at Hansen from this perspective of espionage. If it should become known somehow that I had done this, obviously this could tear our whole family apart. From CBS News, I'm Major Garrett, and this is Agent of Betrayal, The Double Life of Robert Hansen, Episode 4, Plain Sight. Mark Walk and his wife weighed the information about Hansen, Mark's duty to report, against the potential liability. I could be regarded within the FBI as a, a loose cannon, uh, making reckless accusations, 
and that this could harm my career. So yeah, this was a heavy decision for me to make. And uh, my wife said to me, look, you know what the right thing to do is, do it. Walk decided to take his concerns to Jim Lyle, a supervisor in the FBI's Chicago office who focused on Russia. He'd known Lyle for years. I said, hey, look, uh, I've got something I need to talk to you about. Uh, It's very important. And he said, fine. I said, but we can't do it here. Walk says they retreated to an interview room, out of the view of their colleagues. No windows, nothing but a desk and two chairs sitting on either side of it. And I laid out those three factors. The Poland comment, the money in the sock drawer, and the rumor about the mole hunt. Walk said he tried to do this dispassionately, with the requisite skepticism, and not as Hansen's brother-in-law, but as a sworn officer of the law with a duty to report potential wrongdoing. I reiterated, look at I'm not saying that I know this for sure. I'm saying it's enough for a preliminary investigation. And he did pointedly ask me, do you understand what you're talking about? And I bluntly replied, yes, I'm talking about Robert Hansen possibly being engaged in espionage. Walk said Lyle asked how solid his information was, if there were any innocent explanations for his suspicions, and if an investigation was really necessary. He says, okay, uh, I'll handle this. A couple of days later, he did uh, briefly stop by my desk, and he said, I I took care of that. Um, And I took that to mean that he had passed it on. And here's the odd thing about this story. When I spoke with Jim Lyle, his memories were quite different. I don't remember ever, ever being in an interview room in Chicago with Mark Walk. I'm not hiding nothing. I, if I recalled it exactly that way, I would acknowledge that. You'd own that. Oh, absolutely. And if I didn't do something and should have, or if I did do something, I I wasn't going to tell Mark what I was doing. If, if that had happened, that would be what I would be saying. But that's not what I remember. Lyle told us all he remembers was a glancing conversation at Mark Walk's desk in the squad room about Hanson and his wife Bonnie and some money she had found. That's it. I walked away thinking, what was that about? What was that about? That's what I remember. Now, if I remembered it the way he said it, I would acknowledge that. But I'm saying in my brain, that is the only thing I remember. Walk's memory is rich with details and specifics that seem hard to make up or forget. But Lyle maintains their encounter did not happen that way. There was no conversation about espionage. Now, maybe I was supposed to, you know, read through the tea leaves and sort through the fog and, you know, one plus five equals 18, and I was just not smart enough to pick up on it. Lyle says if Walk really did suspect his brother-in-law of being a spy... He should have been more explicit when they talked. If he gave me the biggest spy lead in the history of the FBI, and he's just going to leave that to chance, especially when it's his own blooming brother-in-law, I'm sorry, you know, I I just can't buy that one. I can't buy it. Lyle and Walk have been privately warring over this part of the Hanson story for years. What Walk reported and what Lyle did or didn't do with that information to move it up the chain. Mark Walk again. I can see any number of reasons why he should have done it, namely simply, you know, to fulfill the cardinal rule of every bureaucrat, which is to cover your ass. Uh, Why take it upon yourself to keep information of that explosive and sensitive a nature to yourself when you can put it on somebody else's shoulders uh, and, and let them have the responsibility? Had any kind of investigation into Hansen been launched in 1990, Hansen could have been caught sooner. Worse, this wasn't the last time he would narrowly evade FBI scrutiny. It would happen again and again. Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. The Soviet Union's collapse wasn't as simple as tearing down the Berlin Wall in 1989. 
President Mikhail Gorbachev brought the USSR a new era of openness with the West, a concept you probably learned about in history class. Glasnost. But there were hardliners in the government who wanted the old ways back. A committee of communist hardliners has seized power in the Soviet Union, ousting President Mikhail Gorbachev and declaring a six-month state of emergency. August 19th, 1991. The hardliners staged a coup of Gorbachev's government. The coup leaders included the heads of the armed forces, the minister of defense, and the head of the KGB. In Moscow, 10 tanks from an elite Soviet division have rumbled through ramshackle barricades to the Russian parliament. Some tried to stop what to them was an outrageous violation of the Soviet Union's fragile democracy. With whatever materials they could scrounge, Muscovites began building barricades around the Russian government building. And they took to the that same day, Henson passed secrets to the KGB in exchange for $20,000. He included a piece of advice. To study the period of Chicago history when Richard J. Daley was mayor. Daley was a favorite politician of Hansen's. He liked that Mayor Daley curried favor with his constituents while running the city with an iron fist. We don't know exactly why Hansen would have told them to study the mayor, or if he knew about the coup in advance. As night fell, a group of tanks appeared at the Russian parliament, not to besiege it, but to support Yeltsin's call to defend democracy. The coup backfired and accelerated the fall of the Soviet Union. The head of the KGB was imprisoned. In the KGB's next message to Hansen in October, they reassured him of their commitment to their, quote, friendship and to Hansen's security. But behind the scenes, the Soviet intelligence agencies were getting a shakeup. Some officers were let go out of a job, and who knew what information they were taking with them? It was an opportunity for the U.S. intelligence community to recruit sources, and it posed a security risk to Ramon Garcia, Hansen's alias as a spy. There would have been good reason for Hansen to say, not now, I'm going to just walk away. Ramon Garcia is going to shut down this operation. This is Neil Gallagher again, the agent who worked alongside Hansen in the New York field office in the late 70s. If I don't know who I've been dealing with, what entity within the KGB... But are they going to be compromised? And by continuing this, will I compromise myself? And so that's what Hansen did. Hansen went dark as a spy immediately after the hammer and sickle flag was lowered over the Kremlin for the last time in December of 1991. Days later, he was given a promotion at the FBI to unit chief. Two different personalities, Ramon Garcia, Robert Hansen. Robert Hansen's career has moved. He's gotten to a promotion. He would say, boy, my, my career now has taken a good, dramatic step forward. Ramon Garcia has to worry about whether his identity can be compromised. And it's during this period when Ramon Garcia's career is on hold that something strange starts happening. Hansen begins acting erratically in ways that drew attention. Hansen was always curious about computers and handier with them than the average agent. So handy, in fact, he hacked into a superior's computer and then reported it, supposedly to show a vulnerability in the system. This is not Ramon Garcia looking for more valuable information that he could provide to the Soviets or the Russians. This was Robert Hansen, the FBI unit chief, showing a vulnerability to a system in the counterintelligence division of the FBI. Of course, computer security was not part of Hansen's job. I was working for him at the time, and... Everybody was talking about it and thought it was weird. I was like, that's not normal behavior to do that. Like, that that's not your job. You you don't work in the computer group. Like, you're in counterintelligence. Why are you doing that? This is Kim Minotto. At the time, she was Kim Lichtenberg. She was recruited to the FBI out of high school. By 93, she was 24 and working on Hansen's team as an intelligence assistant, an entry-level position doing analysis and administrative work. Hansen served as a unit chief in the intelligence division. He oversaw a team of around eight employees. 
Hansen was her boss's boss. Folks referred to him as Dr. Death. So that was kind of my first introduction to who he was. And upon meeting him for the first time, I kind of understood the nickname. He kind of looked like an undertaker. He just looked... There was just something about him that as soon as I met him, I felt uneasy. So far, we've heard from male FBI employees who described Hansen as off-putting, but essentially harmless. That wasn't Kim's experience. He would, the way he looked at, especially females in the unit, and it wasn't just me, it was, it was at least one other female who we spoke about it. And when you say how he would look at you, I think I know what you mean, but I'd like you to tell me what you mean. Yeah, it's, it's hard to describe, but as a female, you, you, you just know the way he's he's looking at you. He's he's staring. He's not looking you in the face, of course. And he just, the hair on my arms would stand up. And that was from my very first time meeting him. I felt that. And I had not felt that before in the Bureau. Another FBI official told us that Hansen had opinions about women and was vocal about it. He once heard Hansen tell a female staff member that she shouldn't be working. She should be at home taking care of the household. Kim said Hansen also found ways to brush up against female employees. Just inside the door to the office, there was a sign-in sheet at the secretary's desk. So if you were there signing in and he walked in the door, he would, he would always brush up again. And there was, there was plenty of room to walk through the door without making contact. Subtle things like that that you know what he was doing. But unfortunately, at that time in the Bureau... You couldn't say much. <laughs> I know folks who had said something about, you know, somebody else, and it didn't work out well for them when they kind of came forward. So I knew just to kind of just try to stay away from him. Hansen was her superior at work. Avoiding him wasn't always an option. Some of what happened between Hansen and Kim is public, but this is the first time Kim has spoken on tape. And as a warning... Kim's story contains depictions of violence. I'll start off with, um, at the time, we had a secretary and a typist. And I guess there was some conflict between her and the secretary. And the secretary must have complained about her and said something. She wasn't doing her job. And she she was a young girl. So I had went up to the typist. And I remember saying to her, um, you know, if they give you something to type, you know, Nicole, just make make sure you, you do it. Then, toward the end of the workday, Hansen called a meeting with the secretary and the typist. Kim's desk was at a cubicle up against the wall. She could hear the voices getting louder. He called me in. So I walked in, and he said, did you tell Nicole that she's getting fired or something like that? And I said, no. I just, you know, kind of told her, you know, if she's given something, to just do it. That That's all. And so then he started like yelling at the secretaries, something like, I'm, I'm sick of you coming in to me with this, something to that. And I said, okay, well, if that's all, I have to go because my van pool was getting ready to leave like within five, 10 minutes. And so I just excused myself. I had a friend back at my cubicle who had stopped by to, to visit with me. So as, I'm, as I left his office and I'm walking back to my cubicle, I heard him yell, get back in here. And I said, I really have to go. I'm going to miss my van pole. And that's all I said. And the next thing I know, he grabbed me from behind. He grabbed my left upper arm and twisted me around. And when he turned me around, I lost my footing and I fell. And when I fell, he still held on to my arm. He still had my upper arm. And he started dragging me back towards his office yelling the entire time, I told you to get back in here. Kim said Hansen dragged her along the floor, wrenching the tendons in her arm out of place. At first, I was in complete and utter shock. I I didn't know what to do. And I had yelled, and I was trying to get back to my feet. And I was finally able to get back up on my feet, and he still had a hold of me. And I was, like, hitting his chest to let go of me. Meanwhile, my friend had come out by the cubicle, and she watched the entire thing happen, and she was yelling. And then I just saw in his eyes, like he just snapped out of it, because, and I'll never forget his eyes. He was so angry, 
that I had left that meeting. And it was just, I, I couldn't understand why he would grab me like that. And then I saw him snap too when my friend started yelling. And then he released me. Kim and her friend ran out and went directly to the section chief's office. And I mean, I was crying. I, my friend was crying. I, I couldn't, I could barely speak. Kim's friend explained what happened, and the section chief left to talk to Hansen. When he returned, he told the two women to go home, and they'd talk about it the following day. My husband at the time was not home yet, so I went to my parents, and I was telling them, of course, I was upset crying, and my mom's like, take off your jacket, and that's when we saw the bruises. And my dad was a burly guy, you know, worked in the steel mills, and never seen him cry other than when his mother passed away, and he just burst out crying because somebody hurt me and he wasn't there to protect me. And so he's going to get in his car, and I'm like, Daddy, you can't get in there. Like, you can't do anything. I, I know you're upset, but, He wanted to go know. down to FBI headquarters. Oh, of course he did. So we went to the hospital to have it checked, and, um, you know, they documented the bruises, they documented that, um, and then when I had went to, like, my regular doctor and um, my arm started, I didn't know what it was doing, but it started, like, the, you could see it jumping, like, my arm, like, it was, the tendons were trying to go back into place, and it was, like, you could see it moving under my skin. And I was like, what is going on? And when I went to the doctor, he explained to me, and then they, you know, did an MRI, they did all that, and they saw where it, it left permanent, it never went back. Um, to where it was prior to the assault. And there was no way to correct it. It was just permanent damage. The day after Hansen's attack, two colleagues showed up at her home to take the report. Two agents from my division, which would not happen today. That's not how it's done. I don't even think that's how it was done then, to tell you the truth. So they played good cop, bad cop with me. And I remember my husband at the time said, I want you to look at her arm because I think they were trying to downplay it. And he said, I want you to look at her arm and see her bruises. And when he said that, and I was trying to show them I had a jacket on, they turned their heads. They did not want to see it because I guess if they saw the bruises, they would have to admit that I was assaulted. Kim took matters into her own hands. First, she reported it to the D.C. police. They spoke to the FBI, and the police told Kim that it was an internal matter, and they would leave it to the FBI to handle. Then, she tried to pursue a civil suit. And the Bureau stepped in. And I'll remember the, these words exactly. What he did was in the scope of his employment, so the Bureau would be defending him. Was exactly how it was said. So if you went forward with a civil suit, you would be going up against... The Bureau. And the Department of Justice. Yes. Kim went on medical leave for around 40 days. She saw a doctor, a therapist. She received more than $16,000 in workers' compensation for the injury, but the lawsuit went nowhere. She was given a reprimand, a letter of censure, saying that what Hansen did was wrong, but that she had provoked him. Hansen received five days of leave as punishment. In my opinion, he should have been fired. Because if you assault somebody, I mean, I don't know what it takes to get fired, but to me, that's a fireable offense. Like, you assaulted an employee. I said, at least do a psych evaluation on him. As to what possessed him to do that. What like, is wouldn't the source you of know? this rage? Yes, but no. And you stayed at the FBI. I did. That's that... I got my daddy spunk in me. I just, I wasn't going to let them make me quit. It was tough going back. And, and, you know, it's like a little high school in there sometimes. And, you know, people talk, and it was tough, but everybody had an opinion on what happened. So I just kind of wanted that to be over and just start my career with a new position and just forget about it is how I wanted it. What were those opinions as they were relayed to you? Um, that he didn't grab me, that I just fell that I was making it up, that he didn't assault me. Like, things like that. Like, why would I make something like that up? And what I found so amazing is 
he was not well-liked. But yet folks would defend him, mainly based on he was an agent and I was, at the time, a a low-grade support employee. Kim has been at the FBI for almost 36 years now. She's two and a half years away from retirement. Kim says the FBI has never issued any kind of apology. To be sure, we followed up with the Bureau ourselves. We're still waiting for a reply. In July of 1993, about a year and a half after Hansen broke contact with his Russian handlers, he was having cash flow problems. According to a later government report, he even asked his mother for $10,000. Hansen would make a brazen and sloppy attempt to rekindle his spying career. Now, the timeline is important here. This came about five months after the violent encounter with Kim Minoto and, interestingly, the day after his father Howard's death. They had a difficult relationship, full of slights and criticism. But now all of that was over. Whatever he envisioned himself to be, whatever he envisioned Ramon Garcia to be, the super spy, there were some missteps that he took that I can't explain looking back today. Neil Gallagher again, the agent who worked alongside Hansen in the New York field office. He violates everything he said. This wasn't a very brief walk-up, drop an envelope off. It wasn't mailing a letter. He approached a GRU officer in his parking lot. Hansen had had other FBI employees research the GRU officer. Then Hansen approached him in the morning at a parking garage near the officer's home. And he says, I am Ramon Garcia, like the whole world's gonna say, oh, the famous Ramon Garcia. Hansen tried to hand over a package containing information about double agent cases that the FBI was running against the GRU. But the officer refused to take it. He had no clue who Ramon Garcia was. The officer worked for the GRU, and Ramon Garcia had been Hansen's alias with the KGB. The two agencies did not readily share information. This was something that Hansen probably would have known if he was thinking clearly. Also, what was he doing recklessly making face-to-face contact with Soviets? His tradecraft had always been predicated on remaining anonymous. This is a time where Hansen steps out of his controlled environment of being a, a spy and takes a less than calculated risk because as it would turn out, that person looks at Hansen, doesn't know who he is, and steps back from him and gets in his car and drives away and reports it. The perplexed Russian official blew Hansen off and then lodged a formal protest with the State Department. The Russians thought this was a provocation, an attempt to coerce a diplomat into cooperating with the enemy, a serious diplomatic no-no. The Russians told the State Department this unknown person described himself as a, quote, disaffected FBI agent. The FBI opened a perfunctory investigation into this Russian complaint. The FBI, if they had thought to investigate it, could have gone into their files and said, okay, automated case system, who looked up this intelligence officer's home address in the last month? But of course, the Bureau didn't. If it had, it might have found Robert Hansen. Was Bob Hansen hiding in plain sight? Oh, absolutely. That's Earl Pitts someone who would have a pretty good idea if Hansen was operating under the FBI's nose. Pitts was an FBI agent, and he, like Hansen, was also a spy for the Soviets. And at that time, there was a tremendous security problem inside the FBI because of its institutional attitude that sensitive classified information didn't need to be compartmented within the FBI. Pitts first volunteered his services in 1987. Over the next five years, he sold classified information to the KGB and their successor, the SVR, in exchange for about $124,000. After his former KGB handler defected to the U.S. and revealed that Pitts was a spy, the FBI launched an investigation. He was arrested in December 1996. I was convicted of attempted espionage and, and conspiracy to commit espionage. 
At the time, he was only the second FBI agent in history to have been caught spying. In debriefings following his arrest, the FBI asked Pitts a crucial question. The question that was put to me is if there was anyone else that I suspected or something to that effect. And, and I did tell them that I thought Bob Hansen should be investigated, which to my recollection uh, got quite a response. Uh, I was accused of just trying to shift the blame to someone else. So the instant reaction was hostile to you? Yes, for e- even bringing it up. That hostility may have reflected something deeper. The U.S. intelligence community still had unexplained losses, meaning it still had a mole problem. But the FBI hoped that by catching pits, they'd cleaned house and that the problem was elsewhere. The FBI knew that there were some relatively widespread problems with uh, penetration. I think they wanted it to wrap up any anything that might have to do with the FBI. So I I think that's one of the reasons that there was such a a sharp reaction to me bringing up the name of of someone else. In the FBI? In the FBI, yeah. This is the first time he has spoken at length about Hansen and what he told the FBI about his suspicions. The two incidents that made Pitt suspect Hansen, the hacking of his superior's computer, and the assault on Kim Minotto. Those two things together caused me to think that that Hansen needed to be looked at. Pitts felt these alone were enough to warrant an investigation. He conveyed his suspicions to the FBI. And the Bureau did nothing. And does that strike you as very, very odd? Uh, Yeah, it, it strikes me as extremely odd, simply because if... FBI and Department of Justice policy had just been followed and generally followed, uh, there would have been an investigation. To find out that there was no investigation just shocked me. Is there ever been in your mind a plausible explanation? The most obvious explanation would seem to be that, that people in the FBI understand very well. You don't ask questions that you don't want to hear the answer to. Pitts, like Hansen, came to loathe the FBI bureaucracy. He resented how hard it was for him and other agents to make ends meet in New York. The cost of living was forcing many agents to quit. Pitts channeled his resentments into espionage. I was very angry with the whole situation there, unreasonably so, no doubt. I understood what the consequences could be and, and what the consequences probably would be. That didn't didn't really make any difference to me. Do you struggle with that to this day, the calculus you went through and, and how it all came out? On one hand, you, you can't believe that you uh, started down that road. On, on the other hand, you, you don't see any alternative. After Pitts' arrest in 1996, the FBI ordered an assessment of the damage done by his espionage. That study revealed unusual behavior by his Soviet handlers. Rather than pushing Pitts to steal more secrets, they passively accepted whatever he had to offer, which suggested very strongly that the Russians had someone else on the inside, providing even better intel than Pitts. Of course, they did. After serving 22 years in prison, Pitts was released in 2019. There is no doubt he betrayed his oath, period. But to put Pitts in context, his disclosures were far less damaging and plentiful than Hansen's. Pitts proved that a trusted insider could betray the FBI. Yet, Pitts argues, that didn't change bureau culture. That is the most shocking part, particularly when you look at at how aggressively the FBI was pursuing people outside the FBI and how Hansen seemed to have almost immunity from any, any sort of scrutiny inside the FBI. Another contributing factor? The U.S. had recruited a source in the KGB, someone based in Moscow who thought the mole might be in the CIA. Earl Pitts got caught because a Soviet defector gave him up. But outside of Pitts, who was relatively small potatoes, the intelligence community still could not account for operations that had gone bad. 
Pitt simply did not have access to all of them. Around this time, FBI mole hunters keyed in on a prime suspect, someone who had known about compromised cases. And they went after him where he'd feel it most, his family. I remember walking into a very small, windowless room, just like in the movies, and there were two individuals who stood up with badges, and they said, we're FBI, and we're here to tell you some bad news. Your father is working for the Russians. That's next time on Agent of Betrayal, the double life of Robert Hansen. This series was reported by me, Major Garrett, Arden Fari, and Sarah Cook. Our team of reporters and producers also includes Jamie Benson, Pat Milton, Jake Rosen, and Nellie Watson. Our producing partner is Neon Hum Media. Our senior producer is Odelia Rubin. Zoe Culkin is our associate producer. Original music and sound design by Hans Dale Shee. Additional music from Blue Dot Sessions. Executive producers for Agent of Betrayal are Arden Fari, Shara Morris, and me, Major Garrett. Special thanks to Mark Lima, Megan Marcus, Ingrid Cyprian Matthews, and Steve Racies of CBS News, and Jonathan Hirsch of Neon Hum Media. We welcome you to contact us at agentofbetrayal at cbsnews.com. That's agentofbetrayal at cbsnews.com. Thanks for listening.